before we get started, I wanted to give a little background on the movie. You know, this film, when it first came out, uh, flopped. Uh, it was released about the middle of the year. Disney didn't really like it. They didn't know what to do with it. But uh, on television and video, it completely exploded. How many of you grew up with this movie? Yeah, exactly. There you go. This it just it just completely took off. It was what Christmas Story was for Christmas, you know, bombing and then becoming a sensation. This was for Halloween, basically. Um, I did some research. Actually, when I, when I went to Salem last year, I mean, it. This is like a minor religion there. Uh, <laughs> there's a wax figure of Winifred Sanderson at Count Orlock's Nightmare Gallery. Uh, for the film's 25th, 25th anniversary, uh, the theme for their Haunted Happenings event was Hocus Pocus. They have Hocus Pocus locations, tours. Um, uh, Kathy Najimy made a personal appearance there not long ago. Um, and uh, this is in Salem, but actually tonight, the Smithsonian is screening Hocus Pocus. So, by sheer coincidence. Um, and uh, Disney itself has made about as big a cottage industry out of Hocus Pocus as Salem does in the film. Um, I searched on eBay under Sanderson Sisters and found 6,713 results. I ran a similar search under Citizen Kane and got only 2,245 results because kids just don't dress up like Orson Welles. On Instagram, as of Thursday night, there were 117,277 posts under hashtag Sanderson Sisters. Under hashtag Sanderson Sisters Cosplay, 1,017. Uh, there are currently available licensed Hocus Pocus t-shirts, pins, vinyl figures, magnets, jerseys, coffee mugs, candles, a purse that looks like their one-eyed spell book, buttons, bracelets, keychains, tote bags, Billy, Billy Butcherson masks, costumes, and hoodies ad infinitum. Uh, there and Sanderson sisters tattoos, uh, so not bad for a movie that tanked. <laughs> so, um, so just to, to start with, I'll ask the obvious question: How did you how did you wind up getting this job? You know, it was so long ago. I don't remember. I mu <laughs> I must have ninety three. I must. I'm sure I met with the director and must have showed him a portfolio. And yeah, I don't. I actually don't remember. And it was uh, it was uh, Kenny Ortega who had been a, a choreographer for many years. Yeah, and no, Kenny. Maybe that was part of it because I had worked with Kenny on a movie called Shag when he was the choreographer, and this he was the director. So I must have met with him, and because of my previous relationship on Shag, might have had something to do with him. And he was great. I mean, he was really fabulous. And you were saying how movies with dancers are apparently more fun. So you know, it there's something about it that it makes everyone happy to be dancing and the music. And also there's a certain amount of danger with dancing too, because people do get hurt. And whenever you, there's, there's more of a camaraderie when there's danger involved for some reason, that it brings people together. And <laughs> so you, yeah, it is, I, this could be completely wrong, but that's how I felt about it. Um, now, when you made the choice, uh, what eventually led you to make the choice of using color in the witch's costumes? Because you weren't going with a traditional kind of hackneyed Wicked Witch of the West black on black look. Right. <clears throat> well, as a costume designer, you always, you're working with the actors and you're designing clothes that suit the actors. They're not bigger than the actors. You don't want to ever do anything that is too big for the actor. The actor always has to be above the costume. If you know what I mean, it's you, they don't you don't want them to be wearing some something they can't handle. Like if it was a subtle dramatic actress, you wouldn't put those clothes on those actors. But Bet, <laughs> you know, she was very theatrical. She wore like a clamshell outfit that she was famous for, a mermaid. I mean, you can't. There's no costume design that could be bigger than her. She's kind of a Valkyrie. Yeah. Very much so, and she'll always come above whatever she's got on. And Sarah Jessica was a stage actor as a child and had been an actor, so she was used to wearing you know, big costumes. And Kathy has a big personality. So with the three of them, you never had to worry about designing something that would be too much for them. And Kenny was a stage performer himself. Like, he, d he won't admit this, but he was in a group called The Tubes in San Francisco in the, the 70s. And a very theatrical, group, you know, big platform shoes, purple leather jumpsuits and things. So he had a real feeling for 
flair and color. So he was totally behind it. And you know, the girls thought nothing of it. The studio was like, well, what are these stupid costumes? And and I was just like, huh? What, what were your meetings with the studio like about that? Well, that idea? was interesting because they wouldn't talk to me because I was a lowly costume designer. So they would talk to Kenny. And Kenny was a real showman. And he could sell anything. And, and it, was mostly, it was him that sold the costumes. And he would take them the sketches. And he would say, well, this is what I want. This is what I think will work. This will work with Bet. You know, this will work with the girls. So I was lucky to have a director who supported me. Because if it was just me and a director who was not strong, they would be wearing black outfits. <laughs> but you know, when, when you're a costume designer and you're working with a director, you're always working within the parameters of the director's vision. And if Kenny wanted something else and a different idea for the film, that's what we would go with. Because you know, it's not anarchy. You, you, everyone is working within the vision of the director, within the parameters of what they want to do. And so his parameters were pretty wide and gave, gave us a lot of um, you know, room to breathe with you know, the production design. We had a wonderful um, cinematographer here over at Narito. And just the whole look of the film, there was a lot of support and people willing to go for it. Oh, and by the way, I'll digress for a second. Uh, we have another special guest tonight, uh, Judy Donnan. Is Judy, yes, Judy did the calligraphy in the Book of Spells. Yes. Yeah. Which is a, yeah, a very important prop, which is like another personality in the film. It's Absolutely. very important. Absolutely, and I was looking, I was like, my God, it's every page. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> So I was going to say, um, now, uh, you eventually had Jenny, you said Jenny Green's team at the San Francisco Opera make the costumes. What was your history like with them, and why right. did you choose well, them? Well, I had just done Batman Returns with Bob Ringwood. We co-designed it together. And when I was designing these clothes for the, for the witches, and I showed them to Bob, and I said, who do you think would be good to make these? Because he had done a lot of opera design. And these are very operatic costumes. And there was an English... Uh, dressmaker, sort of a small word for it, but she uh, named Jenny Green, who ran the costume shop at San, San Francisco Opera at that time. And Bob was friends with her, and he said, why don't you call Jenny, and maybe she'll do them for you, because sometimes the opera will take in work when they're not busy, just to keep the shop open. So I contacted her, and she said, yeah, corsets, capes, no, nothing. And so... You know, for her, it was a very easy costume to do because they're very operatic. Yeah, I mean, they could they could wear those costumes in Aida, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, they had the patterns already. For them, it was nothing. So we sent them all the fabric and the sketches, and they made them and sent them back to us. And the fabric, Marietta Lang was the textile artist, the dyer, who d we'd, all the fabric was dyed, it was started off white and was all dyed colors. And you said, tell, tell them the story about the tie dyed oh. shirt. In the in the script, you know, the um, bo uh, Omri Dennison, yeah, yeah. wears a, a t-shirt, a tie-dye t-shirt, and we had all this dye left over from you know Marietta dyeing all these witch costumes. So we said, well, let's just use some of that stuff, and so it'll be like the witch tie-dye. Yeah. So it's uh, and th and I think his shirt has all the witches' colors in it. So where did you come up with all the, the, the little fine details on the, what kind of research did you do for the, the finer details on the witches' costumes? Well, whenever you use symbols, it's always kind of scary because somehow, like really evil, real symbols get in. And that's, you want to make sure that there's nothing recognizable that's going to, you know, be a problem. So I started with like crop circles and the ruin alphabet, and then we used symbols that were recognizable, then changed them. Right. You, you did not offend any druids. No. Okay. <laughs> but you could. But, but we were careful. Now, and crop circles are pretty safe. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, and then Marietta did a stencil and painted it on the witch's dress. And you said uh, the inspiration for Billy Butcher. By, by the way, Billy Butcherson's played by uh, Doug Jones, oh, who's probably familiar fabulous. to a lot of yeah. you. Yeah, 
Doug um, found a, a really wonderful niche for himself playing creatures. He's been the creatures in most of Guillermo del Toro's movies. He was Abe Sapien in Hellboy and the Fawn and the, the Pale Man in Pan's Labyrinth. And he's the amphibian man in Shape of Water and all that. And he's, he's a really dear guy. He's a wonderful guy. But you said his costume was inspired by Ichabod Crane. Well, I had this book as a kid, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And it was a really scary book. And there were some beautiful woodcut drawings, black, pretty much black drawings in it. And I'm not sure who the artist was, but I always loved this this image of Ichabod Crane in this like you know like I don't know 17th century costume. And so it's basically that. I pretty much took it from the book. And you said it, it was. It's not period appropriate, but it looks great. It works perfectly for the character. Yeah, that's the thing. Period is. You know, you want to evoke an emotional response in people, so it, it you know. And this is not a documentary. <laughs> no, I don't think many many professors of, so of I think you could early be, American you history could be pretty complained. loose with the design because yeah. you want the main thing is to get an emotional response from the audience and. And that's totally Doug's build. I mean, he's completely built yes. like Ichabod Crane. Yes, he looks Crane. like Ichabod Crane. Yeah. yeah, I've worked with him several times. He does. Now, in a special effects heavy show like this with the flying rigs and so forth, what kind of s considerations did you have to take in the costumes? We hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have a lot of money, and so we couldn't make a lot of costumes. And I was just looking at that scene with the water, and I thought, oh, my God. I didn't remember that water because we dyed all the fabric and I'm sure we didn't fix the color very well. <laughs> so I can't believe it didn't all run into each other. Yeah, and at that time, the flying harnesses were just awful, awful things. They were blue jeans that had like bits of wool in them, like, you know, lamb's wool and big clamps on the side. I mean, they were really horrible, uncomfortable things. It, now this stuff is great because with Cirque du Soleil, They've designed fabulous flying harnesses. So the flying harnesses now are brilliant. But at that time, they were pretty lame, <laughs> really bad. But the girls, I think because they were stage actors, they had a very high tolerance for pain. <laughs> because they just they hung up there, and they never complained about it. Well, it was funny. You know, uh, Sarah Jessica Parker was on Colbert last year, and he was asking her about it. And she was saying how she just, she just gets so comfortable up there. She'd stay up there during breaks, and she said she could stuff the times into her costume, so she'd just bring it out and read it and so forth. And she didn't, and there was no irony about what she was saying. It was just a fact. It just it yeah, just, and because yeah. you know, Bet being a state, you know, a theater, theatrical stage performer, she was used to some. I mean, these stage actors they go through some pretty miserable costumes, so this was right up there. Now, now, what were your biggest challenges with this show? What were the what were the hardest parts of these costumes? Well, I think the designing the design process, just trying to get them, you know, the colors separated and the characters separated, and you know, making sure the actors could work in them. The flying they were very long, and I was afraid they'd be tripping all over the place. Or, and they they were good. You see, they pick them up a lot, <laughs> so they don't fall over them, but. You know, I think because they were theater actors, they made things work in a way that a lot of times the movie stars are not familiar with. Because when you do theater, you there's a lot of things you have to work with your costume because you're wearing it every night for like, you know, months. So they were very good with making the costume work. If so, I, I think they were real partners in it. Um, one of the things that most impressed me about this is in the crowd scenes, whether it's the kids trick or treating or it's the Halloween dance, is the sheer variety of costumes. You know, you're not blowing it off and having like eight gorillas and ten skeletons and five witches or something. The variety is is incredible. I mean, I even spotted Tron in there, and I think you said there's a story about that. Well, because that was one of the last scenes in the film, and by that point, I had completely run out of money. There was nothing left. And that was at a time where if you ran out of money on a film, they would give you more money. Not like now. You got anything. But not at Disney. You ran out of money, you get no more money. And when they told me that, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? I have this big scene to do. And it's like, you know, tough luck. So, but we did have access to the Walt Disney has a gigantic warehouse of all their costumes. And they take really great care of them. And so... I went through the warehouse and I just picked whatever I wanted and Tron 
And there was, you know, they had like, there was some show where they had three Supremes, I got them. So I mean, you could go through that, that you know, party and find all these different like movies. <laughs> and the closest, there was one of like Elvis that I think was. Yeah, you can see him dancing in the, yeah, yeah, off to the side of the frame. That was from yeah. some, you know, Elvis movie that they did at Disney. But yeah, the, all the costumes were from pretty well known. We couldn't use Mickey Mouse, of course, or anything that was too, or, you know, too recognizable because then they'd, they'd the what? Oh, really? Oh, there was a Mrs. Potts. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Good spotting. Oh, and speaking of Disney, I'm glad you brought that up. Now, um, I, it was funny. Um, I got to give a gold star to Cindy here. She pointed out that uh, the witches are so much like flora, fauna, and merry weather in Sleeping Beauty. And you said you were you were a fan of the movie. Was it conscious well, or was it? Probably. I was a huge fan of the movies and. And I love those three characters too. And they're always kind of twitting each other, like the Sanderson sisters. Yeah, no, I I, I love those those three characters. And you know the Dis the early Disney um, animated films are just so amazing and so beautiful. And when we were working at Disney, you could go into you had access to the um, animation building, and they had all the cells, a lot of the cells up on the walls, and you could kind of when no one was looking, you could sneak around into other you know rooms and look at them. And they were so beautiful, and the colors were so gorgeous and rich. And it was just, it's so great to be around them that it was very inspiring. No, Disney was always hiring really, really great artists during that period. And the color palette of those movies was just astonishing. Yeah, the, um, what was I going to say? Now, what was, how was filming in Salem? Well, Salem, and when you look at the film, the, the colors are unbelievable. And they were having an extraordinary fall that year. It was just absolutely electric. They said it was one of the best falls they had had in 100 years. So, and we were there at the absolutely peak time. So we, it was just really, I was just sorry, but they didn't do a scene in a cranberry bog. So I had never seen a cranberry bog before. And it was just all this like cranberries. Every, it was just, <laughs> but it was so beautiful. So th and the people in Salem were, were really wonderful. And were really into it, although they weren't really into this movie because it wasn't made. But they were very into witches because, you know, it's their history. Well, it hadn't become a giant tourist attraction for them. Yet, right, so. right. But um, actually, it was funny. There's one shot where they're celebrating after they think the witches are dead with the fountain and everything. That's just right over on Hollywood Way. It's right by Gate 11 at uh, Warner Brothers. It's the Friends Fountain with the Omega Man's house in the background. <laughs> it's like right around the corner. So... Um, now, I was going to say, um, you, we were talking about the initial reaction to this. This was kind of like in the, in the 80s, Disney was doing all these unbelievably dark kids movies like The Black Hole and Something Wicked This Way Comes and Return to Oz and The Black Cauldron and all this. And this is almost like the tail end of that, that thread. But tell, tell us about that initial reaction or that, the reaction at that uh, test screening, Well, the executives. Right. We went to a test screening at Disney. There was like, you know, maybe 200 people there. A lot of executives as well. And there were a bunch of kids, but young kids, like four years old, five years old, six years old. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the film, all the kids start crying. <laughs> and the executives go, this is, this is not a Disney movie. <laughs> they said, we can't have kids crying in our, in our movies. And I was like, did you see Bambi? <laughs> 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 People were crying in that. Jesus Christ, yeah, what about all the kids that cried when Gurgi died in the Black Cauldron? Yeah, I but, mean, but you know. At this particular time, there were a lot of very sensitive executives that were really, like, you know, they didn't like the idea of the life being sucked out of kids, and I could see that. It was, it was not the Disney image. But so they kind of uh, were like, yeah, no, not this film. <laughs> but then it had another life when it went on television. It just it was it just got rediscovered. It was it's the definition of a sleeper hit. Um, now you were saying you were really impressed by some of the by the Sanderson sisters cosplay you've seen. Well, when the movie was a huge disappointing flop, I was surprised that I kept getting letters and calls because this is before email letters and calls from like people from theater companies in like Oregon or you know different states, Oklahoma, and you know. Uh, People say, oh, I have a theater company in, in the junior high in, uh, in Texas, and we want to put on 
Hocus Pocus. And I was like, really? <laughs> and they, we wanted to know how to make the costumes. And so it would happen all the time. So I thought, well, this is interesting. I've never had, you know, just did this big Batman movie. No, no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, people really seem to respond to, um, to the girls in Hocus Pocus. And I, I think a lot of it had to do with the color, because people respond emotionally to color. And a lot of that came from looking at these animated stills from, from the old Disney films. Um, now, uh, I was going to say, well, I, think, I think that's about it for my piece. Uh, 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 let's open up the floor to uh, questions. Um, specifically for Winifred's um, dress, it's actually, it's funny you brought up the, the costumes and the cosplay, because I have a friend that has some very, very impressive screen, almost screen accurate um, pieces. And she was actually wondering how many layers are actually in Winifred's um, outfit, like her skirt. Oh, sorry. Did anybody want me to repeat that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, that her under layer is some, is like a very thin silk that's in this technique called primitive pleating. And Marietta Lang, who um, dyed all the costumes, also did the primitive pleating, which she learned how to do like years before when I was an assistant costume designer on a science fiction movie called Dune, like a million years ago. <laughs> And there was a lot of costumes in Dune that were primitive pleated. So she had learned that technique from some Italian costume designers that was, that was a very, that was something that they, it was very common there. So she decided, you know, when I wanted to do the pleating that we had in Dune, she, you know, did it. So it looks like a lot of layers, but it's only one layer of the purple. And, but it's cut in a way that you know, it's cut like on the bias, so it, it looks like there's a lot there. So she's got the top, her top tunic, the, um, the primitive pleated, and then she may have an underskirt and some kind of bloomers. But it's just very, there's a lot of volume in all the, in all the pieces, so it's not that many. Hi, I have one comment and one question. Jenny Green is now down here at LA Opera. Oh, great. As the head of their costume shop. Well, she's brilliant. She is. And if you had been able to get more money, do you remember now if there was anything in particular you really wish, you know, you, you really wanted to do that you would have done with the funding? I probably would have made more costumes and maybe something that was waterproof. <laughs> 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 and... Yeah, I think I probably would have made more, but I was lucky that I had like really talented people working on it. You know, Jenny and her crew were fantastic. Marietta was great, and then we had a bunch of other people that were also did craft work, like the jewelry that made jewelry. So I I just got lucky that maybe when I was doing it, a lot of people were out of work and willing to do it. <laughs> but yeah, I don't I don't know that money would have made a big difference. Because I think we got lucky with the the clothes at Disney, and yeah, I don't. Maybe at the time I would have thought so, but it, it sort of worked out okay. Let's see, more questions. Were you on budget? Well, oh, she's saying, were you on budget at the end? Yes, but it wasn't my idea. <laughs> <laughs> They just wouldn't give me any more money. No, I didn't get a dime more. That, that was it. <laughs> I want to ask you a couple of questions about the... Oh, do you have another question? Or? Yeah, about the pleating, because the only place I ever used was a pleating, which has been out of business for a long time. Is that... Is, are there still people around that are doing... Well, Marietta did the pleating, and it's a pleating that you do by hand. And you make a, you have to make a hot box to put the pleating in. It's like a really elaborate thing. and. It was, it, yeah, you, uh, it's a very, you do it by hand. If it wasn't done by machine, that's why it looks so great. And that's why it's really bad when it gets wet, like, you know, through burning rain. So, <laughs> so <laughs> but she did a fantastic job on it. And I think she had to replete them after they got, after that alpha got soaked in the rain. But because it's done by hand, it's not fixed. When you have it done by machines in like a proper pleating place, it's fixed. But then you usually have to use polyester because it melts and holds it together. And our clothes were all silk. So 
you couldn't you couldn't do it in a in a primitive a real primitive pleading way. I was actually going to ask you a couple of questions about the cast. Um, I hadn't realized before how funny Thora Birch is in this, and you were she you were was saying even she was funnier so in person. Oh my gosh, she was hilarious. You were saying how precocious she was. She was. She was very precocious, and she had a lot. I don't. I think she. I think she liked her costume, which was a good thing, because she could have given me a hard time if she didn't. But she was very precocious, and she was very smart. I think she was like ten. And she had been working for a while, and she was a very bright little kid. And yeah, no, she was really, really sharp. She was one of the sharpest of the, of the four of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. So, I'm sorry. so are you saying then that all these costumes are now in the Disney warehouse somewhere? Well, they were in the Disney dumpster after the movie came out. <laughs> But then people wanted to rent them for Halloween, and they were rented out for, for Halloween for years. And when I had gone to Disney on another movie, and, and one of the people who run the place said, oh, your costumes get rented out all the time. And I said, well, how are they holding up? <laughs> yeah, I hope they don't dry clean them. Uh, Mary, would you be interested in doing a sequel to Hocus Pocus? No. <laughs> no. I wouldn't touch that with a tempo ball. No, I don't like sequels. I don't even like doing reshoots. They said when you finish something and you go back into it, it's like really depressing. <laughs> it, it is. It just seems like, no, yeah, no. But I was also going to ask about um, Sarah Jessica Parker. You said she was just, I mean, they're, they all are obviously having a wonderful time, but you said she was just, she just seemed like she was having the time of her life. She was, she was amazing. It was like, she's the type of person that like birds fly around. She's... <laughs> She was just so sweet. In fact, I got a call from the opera house up in San Francisco. They were making clothes. And they said, you know, we're going to be late delivering the clothes because our machines broke down. And I said, well, whose clothes were you working on when they broke down? They said, oh, Sarah's. I said, that's impossible. That's impossible. Machines would not break down working on her clothes. <laughs> I said, you should check that. And they're like, oh, you're right. It was Beth's outfit. I go, well. <laughs> Of course, because she has so much electricity. If she came into this room, all the lights would, you know, be, but yeah. So it, yeah, she was just like the most gentle person, Sarah. You know, she probably still is. But at that time, she was like really, it was like birds around her all the time. Well, I was, I was going to say with the movie, turn, it's now that it's 26, I was going to say, did you ever think it would achieve this kind of lasting popularity and... Well, when, when the people from the local theater companies would call me about the cousins, I thought, well, someone's watching this. But I, w I am surprised that it, it sort of held up the way it did. And that's because of the personality of the actors. I mean, Bette really, really pulls it off. Well, the funny thing was, you know, Disney thought of this as like, oh, this is too scary for kids. But kids love scary, you know, so... I, it just, for whatever reason, it just took a little time to uh, to find its audience. Well, I think it was the people at that time at the studio that were a little skittish, because you know, certainly they've done other terrifying movies of the past, you know, deer, mother killing, and things. <laughs> <laughs> I would pay a lot of money to see Disney's deer, mother killing things. <laughs> Hard R. Um, are, are there any more questions, or uh, right there? Did you make a separate set for flying, um, which was ex She was asking, did, did she make a second set for flying with extra volume and stuff? Extra length. I, th the corsets were laced, so they were probably, and they, you only saw them in from the front, and they always had those big capes on. So I'm sure the, there was, they were really wide in the back. When they when they were flying because of the the harnesses, but I don't think we did. I don't, I don't think we. I think we had like for stunt doubles, we may have had like three or four or maybe four of each costume. I think we had four of each costume. They were pretty long. Yeah, they were they were pretty long. That's why the girls were always having to pick them up to keep from tripping on them. But the capes look very long in the flying. So. Yeah, there may have been, I think there were some, some flying capes because they were a lighter material, which, um, yeah, there's some very, very lightweight China silk that is super lightweight. There's actually 
illegal now because it's so fire, you know. <laughs> so flammable. It's so flammable. I have a question over there? Uh, yeah, I did want to ask a question. Um, the green, um, the the main green dress, was that velvet? Was that velvet? Green velvet. Yes. Okay, and I noticed there were uh, you were talking about the symbolism. Um, how did you? What was the technique for that? Was it was it almost looked? I mean, I was sitting all the way back here, so I couldn't really see it very well. Right. But it almost looked like bleached into the velvet. Brilliant. <laughs> Ooh, you got it. it. Right. <laughs> no, cool. this could was, you talk? Could you talk about that? I'll, I'll try to do it fast because cool. it's a long story. This is another um, technique from our friends in Italy, where this is a very popular technique that Marietta had learned when we were doing Dune, that we, the white velvet for Winifred's dress was dyed green and not fixed, so the dye wasn't fixed. So when you we cut out the symbols, we meaning Marietta, and she bleached it. <laughs> You know, she dyed, uh, I think we like used a spray mount and sprayed it onto the fabric so the cardboard stencil would stay. And then a very lightweight bleach and water mixture was sprayed on. And then you just looked at it and go, now, now, pull it up quick. <laughs> <laughs> and so then that's how it was done. And luckily, the bleach didn't eat away at the fabric, which is something that could happen very easily because we couldn't rinse them because you know we didn't want it to bleed. So it was a very light, just a tiny bit of bleach and water. And this was a technique that I had never seen before that Marietta had learned from, and I think we had some opera, pe uh, opera people from Italy who use this technique a lot in the opera. Uh, more questions? Let's see. Hi. Um, what part of the design process like gets you most inspired to work on a project? When it's over. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when they asked Christopher Walken what his favorite word was, and he goes, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's ex it, that's not a good answer. It's, it's exciting. That's a great answer, actually. <laughs> <You're just laughs> the, the research is really fun. You know, I always keep you're always work as I said, you're always working within what the director's vision is. So you have to stay in touch with with whoever that person is and then what the actors are willing to wear. Because you don't want to suddenly, you know, make something that they're just like, I'm not putting that on, which happens. <laughs> but you know, the whole thing has its and the, the whole thing has its own, you know, excitement to it and it goes in stages. And then once it's finished you want to to stay together, you know, not fall apart, and you know, make sure that your set customers. And I was lucky with Bet Pam Weiss, who had a long relationship with Bet, who was also the costume supervisor, was her personal dresser on the set, so that was really great. So we had really good people taking care of the clothes because they were kind of fragile. Hi, um, so can you say a little bit about um, the overall character design? Because there's just so many beautiful details that um, kind of cross over between wigs and makeup and their beautiful long nails and the costumes. Can you say a little bit about the collaborative processes with you and the other uh, designers and uh, heads? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because the wig designer did just an amazing job. Absolutely, especially on Bet with that, that kind of like Bride of Frankenstein and red sort of thing. Right, and the and the makeup was and there weren't. I think Bet may have had a little bit of prosthetics. Oh, you know, she of course had those teeth, but <laughs> those aren't her teeth. But I, I don't think Sarah had. The other girls didn't have prosthetics on, but I think it was just Bet. But it was very subtly done, and uh, and the wigs were really really great. I think we had a like a usually have a day where you do hair and makeup tests. And a couple different wigs and and makeup was tried on the actors, and I think Bet worked very closely on her own with her makeup artist Kevin Haney, I think it was, who was who did a fantastic job, and um, Hazel Catmill was the um, the wig maker, and I think definitely Bet's wigs, and I think she made Sarah's wigs too, and because all the girls had wigs on. So yeah, no, they did a brilliant job. And I don't really n remember too much collaboration with them. It was sort of like, let's keep trying this. And, and, I, 
and I love Beth's. I, I immediately thought Beth's wig was great, and Sarah's. And but when I saw Kathy's, I thought, really, <laughs> really. <laughs> and I don't think I ever really liked it. But now when I look in, in I think, oh, it's perfect. But at the time, I just thought, I don't, I don't know. It's kind of like comical. But it turned out to be so. You don't always, you know. It's not something I would have designed if I was designing the wigs, but it works better. So, you know, usually when you collaborate with people, better ideas come in than, than you would have thought of. Um, we'd like to ask you about uh, Crazy Rich Asians and what the process would be f that's different from Hocus Pocus to a contemporary film that you've done also. Well, they're really not not that different in that you are always trying to um, work with the thinking about the audience and getting an emotional response from the audience. And in Crazy Rich Asians, people at like the director and producer at first they were saying, "Well, this is a fashion film. This is a fashion film." And then when I would talk to John Chu, the director, he talked about characters. He never talked about fashion, and. It was it was a culture because it's age, crazy rich Asians. I'm not I'm not Asian, and I said to John, I said, well, you know, you're going to have to help me to understand the subtleties of the characters, you know, and he said, well, I'm from Northern California. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, great. Well, what about the writer? He goes, yes, Kevin Kwan, the writer, who's from Singapore, who wrote the books, who created the characters. He, I said, well, can you put me in touch with him? And he said, absolutely. And John was great, because a lot of times, directors wonder if I am the director, I have control. And John wasn't like that. He was like, whatever makes this better, let's do it. So he put me in touch with Kevin, and I talked to Kevin like every day for like two months. And he was writing the third book, so he really gave me a lot of time. And he gave me a lot of pictures of his family from China. And because they started off in, I guess his grandparents started off in China, then they immigrated to Singapore. And we made lists of what each character would wear, what colors they would wear. So I got a lot of subtlety from Kevin Kwan, the writer. And because I, I didn't want it to be like, although I love fashion, I didn't want it to be you know, a fashion film. I wanted the fashion to relate to the, to the characters. And John Chu, was, he, he saw the film in a lot of fairy tales. So there were, again, there were a lot of fairy tales in Crazy Rich Asians. He did a lot of reference to Wizard of Oz. Like in the in the beginning, in New York, it was all black and white. Then we went to Singapore. It was in color, like when Dorothy goes to Oz. And there's a lot of Cinderella references in it. You know, once again, you're working with a director and within their vision of the film. And John had a very strong vision of the film, which, you know, is the same on every film you work on. So in many ways, every film you work on, whether it's, a prison story, and everyone's in you know uniforms. You still want to give character to the prison uniforms to bring out the characters of the. So it's all films in many ways are all the same. But um, I, I was actually going to ask you about um, you know doing Batman Returns, and um, that was this was what it was 1992 I think it was about the, it was before. just before you did this yeah. Um, we were talking a while ago about the differences in materials in, say, like Batman's costume versus what they use now and so forth. Now, that was just when this whole super super uh, hero movie craze was really taking off. How different differently were things done then in costuming those films than they are now? Well, as I said, I did that design that film with Bob Ringwood, who did the first Batman. So he did like the first, you know, really unusual superhero suit. And he designed the first Batman suit because Michael Keaton, who was the character who had, Tim Burton had hired, who was supposed to be Rat Boy instead of Batman, that the studio was like, you know, we can't have Rat Boy. So Bob had to make this costume that was a body. So it was basically he had to create a body for Michael Keaton, where there was none. And <laughs> But that the technique that that technique came from when I was his assistant on Dune, and all oh, right with the still suits. suits, yeah. And the technique of that we made leotards, like just plain black leotards, and on Dune, like foam 
was carved and glued on top, and then rubber was painted over it. So that was the that was the technique on doing. Unfortunately, those costumes got lice, and the <laughs> or bug, some kind of biting bug. Because you guys were shooting in Mexico in the we were desert, I think. Shooting in Mexico yeah. in the desert, yeah. which is not a good place for like organic materials. And uh, but, yeah, so that wasn't good. So that's where that kind of put on musculature kind of yeah. look came from. So yeah. then when Batman was done, the first Batman, it was still similar to the do the still suits, you know, the body suits, and then the carved foam, and then the, the rubber over it. And when we did the next one, when when I did the next one with Bob, the I think we had moved, I'm not I think it, it may not have been silicone, but it was definitely a more dense fabric than, than the softer foam that we had used on Dune. So it was uh, a little more insect proof. And, <laughs> and being in California, it's a little cooler. And, but it w and then it was still coated in rubber and we had to have a big hot box for it. Now I think it's all silicone. It's a much, a much simpler technique. Right, because when you see, for instance, the Batman costumes now, they've gone like they've oxidized and they're starting to go yeah, white and so forth. Yeah, but the whole idea of this yeah. big, heavy, you know, costume, big sculpted thing, was because of you know Bob giving Michael Keaton this like superhero body. I mean, you look at Superman and, and Chris Reeves never he just had this like leotard on, or you know, you know, The Rock. He doesn't wear. <laughs> he just wears like a t-shirt. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> poor no. Michael Keaton. <laughs> no, but we love you, Michael. <laughs> no, but he's an actor. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. he's a great actor, you know. So he has that. And I remember and what a big, a I remember being a little a little kid when you know the first Batman came out, and what a shock it was! Oh my God, they're you know they're going against the orthodoxy of this comic book look, and of course now it's like they change from movie to movie to movie to movie. There's no, yeah, they're they're not on book for virtually anything. So, but um. Apparently, Disney sells like I think a million dollars worth of DVDs and Blu-rays of it every year. I mean, it's just it's probably a more than what the movie costs. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but uh, well, no. Well, Mary, thank you so much for thank coming you, out. For I coming. it's been great. Thank you much appreciated. Thank you.